What is going on everybody? My name is Anner Exocosmo and welcome back to another Overwatch video. So BlizzCon line has officially wrapped up and things are starting to cool down a bit, but what's in the future for Overwatch 2? Well, that's what we'll be discussing in this video because on top of the information we got day one, Jeff did do an interview with IGN where we get even more information on where the game is headed. Now getting onto the important stuff, just like one of my last videos on Overwatch 2, go watch that by the way, I do explain everything from BlizzCon and what's coming to Overwatch 2 from that panel. This is a pretty heavy topic because there is a lot of information here. So before I get started, a large percentage of you who watch are not subscribed, so if you do enjoy my videos and find yourself watching, then please consider hitting that subscribe button, that would mean the world to me. Also, I never really mentioned this, but I do have a Discord, the link is in the description, it's super fun to talk to everyone in it, so please join, we do special events and giveaways, and sometimes you'll even get to be in a video. For example, today I asked to see a bunch of people's pets, so here are some pictures of people's pets. Aww. How cute, this could be your pet, so please be sure to join as well. Enough blabbing now, let's get into the interview because there's a lot of stuff here that actually wasn't talked about during BlizzCon Line because we couldn't really ask questions because no one was there because it was a stream, so I'm super excited to see everything in this interview. So it starts off with IGN asking, or saying, I really enjoyed the presentation, there's a lot more new details about the game in there, and I went in expecting a lot to dig into. And Jeff said, I'm glad to hear that, we're really hoping that the players just see a lot of stuff, and I think there's a lot of easter eggs in there too. Not even deliberate, just stuff we overlooked, and well, we probably revealed something by mistake, because there's a lot of content in there. And yes, they did, uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> IGN, I'm going to start with a very obvious question, that I feel we should just get out of the way. Obviously we didn't get a release date in the presentation is the idea with overwatch 2 at the moment that it's a ready when it's done situation you talk a lot about unfinished experiments because of those uh, is there just no point to putting a time scale on it Jeff said, yeah, I think in general, that's how we usually operate at Blizzard. Not always. There have been cases where we've announced a date and then had to push it back, but generally we just don't want people getting too excited about a date unless we feel really confident. And I understand that because we saw that happen with last year's BlizzCon. Everyone just got super, super hyped. And then we get disappointed when it takes a while to come out. So, and then he said, and the number one thing that we care about is the quality of the game. It's the one of Blizzard's values. Have you been out on the Blizzard campus? And then he said, I I haven't actually and then Jeff said oh, well I haven't been there in a year I don't even know if it's still there but we used to have a statue with the orc and the company values around it and one of those values is commit to quality making sure the game is right is the most important thing for us at this time so that's what we're really focused on delivering on the expectations of what a sequel are I think that's core to us and I agree with that for Blizzard, like they really tend to do that with their games. Overwatch has never really released anything before it's needed to be released, like they're pretty good with like all the heroes and stuff, so I'll take Jeff's word on that one. Then IGN says, I'm sure this comes without a time scale as well, but is there a plan, as with the original Overwatch, to have an open or closed beta phase before we get to the eventual Overwatch 2? Or is this more of, it's going to be ready when a situation? Jeff said, no, I think at this point we're not going to be able to pull an Apex Legends on the world and just announce its release. <laughs> I think this is the exact opposite strategy for whatever it's worth. Announce it super early, we'll be pretty transparent. Uh cap <laughs> but actually they've been doing a better job so we've already been having internal milestones those have been extended play tests that have involved people outside of just our team playing the game then we'll probably move into some sort of alpha internally for a while that'll probably be more under wraps and there won't be a lot being publicly talked about and then it's very likely we will move into a closed beta that will be more in the public eye at that point and it's still not determined if we are actually doing an open beta or not i have a hard time imagining in the era that we live in there not being some sort of open beta happening at some point but nothing's committed to it yet please blizzard if you're watching this give me a key <laughs> please blizzard <laughs> That's the one thing I'd pray for like honestly that would be like my dream to get a key to the closed beta <laughs> just to like show you guys everything and also for me to play it obviously <laughs> Then IGN says, one thing I would love to talk about is just the sheer scale of this presentation. You cover so many different areas, is this turning into more of a sequel than you expected it to be going in? 
And Jeff said, no, I think it's kind of the opposite. I think in a lot of ways, we didn't communicate it at BlizzCon 29 accurately. We tried to. We tried to tell people that this is a true sequel, not a DLC. This isn't just something that should be a patch, but obviously we didn't do that correctly because people just sort of created their own dialogue around what the game is. That There, there was always this vision of the game. This has always been what we've had our eyes set on. I'm somebody, if you look at my career personally, I've made expansions, I've made patch updates. I've had a very clear picture in my mind of what the difference between an expansion and a patch and a versus a sequel and our goal is always to make a sequel and just saying i've been saying since day one that overwatch or blizzard was gonna go over the top with this because everyone was saying it was a dlc i knew it wasn't gonna be a uh, dlc because as much as there's like the money hungry companies out there like ea like that you know they release like stuff that shouldn't be released like blizzard never really does that so i don't know why everyone put this like kind of like money hog look on blizzard because i feel like they're not really money hogs compared to other brands Next, IGN says, I guess that perception comes down partly to the fact that there is a connection with the original Overwatch here. It wasn't mentioned too much in this panel, but I assume that connection is still the plan for PvP. Overwatch and Overwatch 2 will still be connected. And Jeff said, we feel like it's super important to keep the community together. That's just one of our biggest goals. It's so odd to me if we were going to rewind to BlizzCon 2019 and I were to just say, hey, we're making Overwatch 2. It's a sequel. It's going to have all this amazing PvE content, story missions, hero missions, all the new PvP maps. We're going to add new heroes. We're going to change how a bunch of the PvP works. See you later. Overwatch 1 people, hope you buy Overwatch 2. The weirdest part is everyone would just go, oh, they're making a sequel. But the second you go, let's try and be a little bit cooler about what we do with the community. We actually get destroyed by that very community. It's something I hope in some ways influence people to think about how they want to be treated as a community. Maybe there are some ways that we can do things that are better, cooler, both for the game company standpoint, but also from the community standpoint, because the reaction we got was very much like, no, treat us like we've always been treated before. And it's like, well, that's the, what this behavior is going to lead to if we're not careful. And I agree, the community was so set on fire a little bit when everything was announced and I think we just got to give them time and I think the community is going to get um split up a little bit just for like pvp and pve IGN then says with that in mind then are you able to give a sense of what the impact of the changes that you're showing particularly in pvp and overwatch 2 will be on overwatch 1 because I think that's where people have a disconnect when you're talking about things like the weapon sound pass or animation changes where does the buck stop for where overwatch 1 can improve versus where overwatch 2 will Jeff Kaplan says, I think there are going to be two types of changes to think about. One are purely technical changes, advancements in technology. If we update the system specs, the updated engine, those types of things will enable us to do things we can't do currently. That's one set of things. The second set of things is purely a psychological standpoint, a community's ability to accept and adapt to changes. Uh, what can we get away with in a patch in Overwatch 1? When does the community accept a massive change that can only come with a sequel? Both of those things are in consideration. Our general thought and philosophy is that we shouldn't just be holding things for Overwatch 2 that would benefit Overwatch 1. We should try and get those out to our community as soon as possible. And I agree, I think if we're having a giant fundamental change, like I mentioned in my video yesterday that Overwatch might be going 5v5, that is a change we should be waiting for Overwatch 2 with, not Overwatch 1. Now that we know the second game is coming, we should be waiting for those giant changes to come in Overwatch 2 instead of Overwatch 1. So I kind of agree with Jeff on that one. <laughs> And you see that in content balance changes that we're doing or just general changes to the game. Recently, we added priority pass to improve queue times. It'd be easy to make an argument like, oh, we should just hold on to that and bolster the perception value in Overwatch 2 for stuff like that. But we feel like, no, this is something that there's no reason to wait for it. Let's just get it to our community as soon as possible. And once again, I agree with that. So there are certain things that are tied to Overwatch 2 either thematically, psychologically because of player change, technically because of engine improvements, and then there are other things that we just get that we think should get to Overwatch 1 community immediately, and we really take all of them on a case-by-case -case basis. It's a constant discussion of what should go in what branch and let's make sure that we're serving players as much as possible. And like I said, I agree with that fully. Um, these are like more bug fixes than content. And I know a lot of people have also said that the priority passes is not content. And I agree, it's not content. It's a bug fix for a problem with queue times. <laughs>
IGN then says, obviously there are changes that are coming to Overwatch 1 that will be part of the Overwatch 2 community. Is the plan still for those PvP audiences to be able to play with each other despite the fact that there may be differences between those two games? Jeff says, yes, the plan is really to have two PvP audiences converge, or I guess a better way to say that there would be one PvP audience, they're just enjoying the PvP experience. IGN then says, but will those still be within single console families, or is there any plan for cross-platform play? Could an Overwatch 2 PvP player on PS5 play with an Xbox One Overwatch 1 PvP player? Is there any movement on that? Jeff says, we are extremely supportive and excited about the concept of crossplay. We love it in other games in general. Our thought is any system the game can adequately run on and any way that people can play with their friends, even just for reasons of improving the matchmaking experience. We're very excited about those ideas and we don't have anything officially to announce or talk in detail about anything today. But in general, the team stance is that crossplay is exciting. We are interested in exploring it. And if we can overcome the hurdles, we would love to see a feature like that being brought to our players one day. Now, this worries me a little bit to a point. I think PvE crossplay, P PvE, not PvP, <laughs> PvE crossplay would work extremely well. And that's going for everything PC to console to console to, or not console to Switch, but PS4 and Xbox to Switch, because we have to admit that there are some differences between the Xbox and the PS5 and the Switch. The Switch is just. And it, Overwatch doesn't run as well on the Switch as it can on a PS5 or Xbox, and I'm pretty sure everyone knows that. And PC players would not fit in well with console players in PvP, but I think for PvE, I think this would work really well, and I think it's going to be a very important part of Overwatch 2, honestly. So my opinion on crossplay is that I think we do need it, but maybe not for PvP, because that might not go too well. I mean, Xbox and PS5 should be able to like converse with each other, but definitely not PC and like console because there's just such a big skill gap there. And then IGN says, in terms of the stuff that's going to be in Overwatch 2, I don't think I'd quite grasp how expansive you're aiming to make the hero missions mode. I think it's Aaron Keller in the video that says he wants there to be hundreds of missions and for people to come back night after night to play them. Are you approaching this with a daily challenge approach? Is that how you're going to deliver those variations? Jeff says, so here's an interesting way to think about it. As we know, PvP is highly replayable. We have a huge audience today. We're sitting in 2021 for a game we launched in 2016 with millions of people playing it, which is awesome. So we know the replayability is high there. We want to make the story missions like the campaign have an element of replayability to those, but we're not under the illusion that a linear campaign is going to be highly replayable. And that we showed at BlizzCon 2019 that real mission and a lot of people are like, oh, I don't see how I'm going to play that for thousands of hours. And we're like, yeah, I don't think you are going to play that for thousands of hours. That's not the goal. But we are building hero missions on the PvE side of the game, specifically targeted at replayability, and we're hoping to achieve that through four main axes. The first is, unlike the, in the story missions, in the hero missions, you can play whatever heroes you want. In a story mission, it doesn't make sense that Widowmaker and Tracer are together because they're enemies and they shouldn't be fighting side by side, unless we constructed some bizarre story where that happens, which might happen now, but you can play whatever heroes you want. So as you know from PvP, the hero comps changing really changes the dynamic nature of the game and adds replay playability. The second factor is that you're going to be fighting different enemy types in hero missions. So sometimes it's going to be against Null Sector, sometimes it's going to be against Talon, and then there are might be other new enemy types that we haven't announced yet that you would be fighting against as well. So adding variety to the enemies and having them fight and be challenged in different ways is exciting to us. The third access is locations. The plan is at this point, we really have a robust map catalog from Overwatch 1 and we have maps from Overwatch 2. That's just talking about PvP maps, but we'll also have all of the PvP or PvE experiences we're creating. So you're going to have this variety of locations to fight in, which is going to add a dynamic nature. And then the fourth axis is different objective types, and you see some of these in Blizzcon Online video. Sometimes you're doing things more defensive in nature, protect the satellite uplink, uplink dish, for example. Sometimes you're doing things more aggressive in nature, you know, there's a poison gas cloud coming our way, we've got to get out, get to extraction. We're hoping to come up with as many objectives as possible. And then we're hoping for these four things all combined together are then fueled by the progression system, and that's going to have things like leveling heroes up, changing their base stats alone, interesting, unlocking those talents points, and then 
there are other elements of the progression system that we haven't announced yet or talked about yet. It's something that we have a lot of experience with at Blizzard. If you think about a game like Diablo or World of Warcraft, in some ways, those games are almost driven mostly by progression systems in the game, even more than that, just core combat. What's exciting about Overwatch is that it's really dynamic, fun, core combat. Now being fueled by this hero mission system and the progression system, we think it's going to be pretty deep and rich by the time we're done with it. Now, this makes you think, are we only playing as Overwatch? Because I think these missions are really, really important. Are we going to be able to play as the bad guys too? That's what I'm wondering, but I do think that Blizzard is going to come through and do a good job so this isn't like the Archives event. Let's be real here, as much as the lore from the Archives event is really, really cool, that event is like kind of boring once you play through it once. And we're looking for replayability here. So I, I'm hoping they're going in the right direction. <laughs> IGN then says, That really was the bit that sparked my imagination as I watched. That tinkering element is super exciting to me. We see a kind of variety of different effects that we can add, including seeing Mercy being able to do an area of effect resurrection, an ability removed from the original game. Are we going to see that a lot of original or lost abilities coming back to the PvE progression system? Jeff says, absolutely, and the way I like to think about it is that there are just some ways or things that are horribly broken in PvP and feel terrible in PvP. Like when you're on the enemy team and Mercy resurrects all five players after you killed them all, it felt really terrible, <laughs> and that's why we need to change it. That is true. As an Overwatch player who played during that time, that really felt terrible. <laughs> There's other things like crowd control abilities. Crowd control abilities, when you're the one doing them, it feels fantastic, it feels powerful, it feels game-changing. When it's being used against you, it feels terrible. So in PvP, you've noticed over the past year, we've been toning down crowd control in Overwatch 1 just to make the game feel better, but we can do things like it's shown in the BlizzCon video. Hey, do you want to change Reinhardt's Fire Strike into Frost Strike? Now it's freezing enemies. One of Reinhardt's other new talents is that he can pin more than one enemy, and again, that's something that would feel terrible on the enemy team in PvP, but feels great in PvE. And by the way, this was mentioned in another past videos on all this Overwatch 2 stuff. I've made so many Overwatch 2 videos at this point that I've predicted like half of it. So I'm just such a big brain. I can't help it. <laughs> so we can suddenly get away from things, you know? I don't know if we have any that are specifically to this, but I use it as an example with our team all the time. Like we can do a 10 second stun in PvE if we want. The robots aren't going to complain that we do that. So it's been much fun. I think Jeff Goodman, he's our hero lead designer. He has some quote that we get to play Frankenstein and Mad Scientist, basically all the things that we always wanted to do, so the creativity has just been through the ceiling. IGN then says, it feels like it sort of unlocks a whole different, or for want of a better term, it kind of unlocks a different talent tree for the developers as well, you know? There's a whole set of things that work through here, and Jeff says, absolutely. IGN says, do you have any favorite PvE builds? We would love to see the video where Soldier76 is able to walk with his area of effect healing that also boops people. Jeff Kaplan says, we already nerfed that, we got rid of that. What's funny is people are like, should we show that because we got rid of that? That turned out to be really terrible and we're like, yeah, we should just show work in progress. Builds that I love, I have many. I'm not normally a Junkrat player, but we're doing a Junkrat playtest where we were testing some of our progression systems and I was asked to check out the Junkrat trees and one of his trees, the end talent in the tree is that you can dual wield grenade launchers. And I'm like, how can that even be balanced and not super broken? And I remember I actually ended up shadow playing a bunch of gameplay because I was laughing so hard and my team was laughing so hard and having so much fun. To the hero designer's credit, it was Jeff Goodman and a gentleman by the name of Brennan. Brennan who made that talent. It was balanced, it was fun, and it was super cool. The Reinhardt builds are fascinating. We keep doing these Reinhardt playtests because not that you have to go to these extremes, but I think a lot of us end up having to go to these extremes. There's what I'll call just the Reinhardt Wrecking Ball build where you can basically say to your team, I hope you never want to see the shield again because you're not going to see it when I'm playing this build. And it's all about aggression and the hammer moving forward and then the exact opposite of that. There's the Reinhardt build where basically the shield is all the power up to including you can make the shield bigger. It's just awesome. And so there's these two different builds. One is like you're never going to see the shield and the other is expect to see nothing but the shield. It's really less player creativity and the player play style preference dictate how they want to play the hero, which is pretty fun in my opinion. And I think this is important, not just for PvE, but for PvP too. Giving these heroes new fresh abilities if they need to, if it's broken and now is the time since we're getting the new game and like i said these fundamental changes that just have been broken with the game that are have never been able to be fixed with just a patch this is what we need 
IGN says, obviously Reinhardt is a fairly major point throughout the video, right down to the tinkering existing PvP version of Reinhardt. Has that expanded creativity from the design team built into those experiments in some way? Have you unshackled yourself from how you were going to force to think about PvP before? Jeff says, we have a lot more tools in our toolkit, which is cool. Some of that is on the creativity ideation side, but it's also a lot on the technical and art side as well. It's easier to pivot on these heroes when you have a bunch of animations, visual effects, great gameplay code that now lets you be able to make these abilities we've unlocked a little bit. The Reinhardt PvP changes, those are coming from more of a place of just watching and listening to player feedback, and also watching what people like and don't like about the tank role. One of those things that's on the table, I don't know if you'd actually do this or not, but we've thought about just renaming the role in Overwatch 2 to Brawler instead of Tank, just to reset expectations, not only you as a tank player, but also of your team for what you want out of this guy. Right now, it's not uncommon in a game of Overwatch 1 to log in and just have someone like, we need a shield, you have to play a shield, don't take the shield down. And you're like, well, I didn't feel like holding left trigger or right mouse button the whole game. That wasn't my idea of how I wanted to play Overwatch tonight, but I'm being forced to. So we're trying to rethink maybe the way the game is played a little bit and redefine what PvP needs. Hey, we're not in Overwatch 1 anymore, we're in Overwatch 2 now, it's okay for it to be different. In fact, how many years are we going to play the same game before we think it's time to move on and experience something different and allow us to evolve, which I think is good. One thing I'd love to know, and then IGN says, One thing I'd like to know with a kind connection to both PvP and PvE, you've got a custom game mode and arcade modes that are a bit more casual. Is it even possible or is there any thought about bringing those talent tree versions of PvE characters into PvP in a less competitive setting? And Jeff says, I think this would have to be a completely not competitive setting. We haven't done anything official yet, but we've definitely talked about it. We know that players are going to want to play with these talents in PvE or PvP just straight up. I think it's horribly broken to play with these talents in PvP, but I also am very open to allowing the players to try it and find the fun if they can find the fun in that. So it's an idea that we've definitely entertained and would be excited. There are some slight performance issues like the game tuned and balanced to run on all systems in PvE versus PvP. There are different considerations, but I'm sure we can work through those, and a lot of times when we enable stuff in the workshop, people are just like, you're not going to get a good frame rate doing that. <laughs> they kind of accept it, like, oh, is that a pyramid of Torb I'm seeing? <laughs> I wonder why I'm only getting 30 frames a second right now. Great game mode, by the way. <laughs> IGN then says, to move to a different part of the game, I'd love to touch on story mode. We know very vaguely what the story is about in Overwatch 2, but is that campaign mode in which we will only play a selection of characters from the reformed Overwatch? Are there only good characters available in story missions, or will we be able to play all the characters along the way? Jeff Kaplan says, in the story missions, currently the plan is that some of the story missions are a mandated set of four characters. That was like our Rio demo at BlizzCon 2019. Other missions are more open and allow for some hero choice, but only heroes that make sense contextually for that story. Which I was kind of talking about before, I agree that it should be like that. You shouldn't just be able to play any hero you want. It is unlikely that we will have a cohesive campaign that contextually incorporates all 32 of the existing known heroes and that there are real some edge cases like Hanzo or Wrecking Ball. How do they fit in? Why would it make sense for them to be on a mission with Overwatch? But I'm hoping to incorporate as many heroes as possible in the story missions. That's been one of our goals, but whether we get to all 32 plus the new Overwatch 2 heroes, it's unlikely that we'll hit 100% completion before that. IGN then says, and will we be able to play story missions solo or offline or is this still definitely an online team game in that regard? Jeff Kaplan says, I'll give you a weird answer. It's kind of both. It is definitely an online cooperative story experience. That's what we think is cool and unique and innovative about it. You don't traditionally play story or campaign games with other people, and we think that's going to make it feel very distinctly Overwatch or Overwatch 2. With that said, we are working on friendly AI, and we, if we can get to a point that we're satisfied with, we're okay with the AI existing in some cases. An easy example is if someone goes Link Dead or something, we don't want to ruin the experience for the other three players. Perhaps we just let you play with AI, but that's not officially decided yet, and there are a lot of technical hurdles for us to get over. So we're working on the friendly AI. I don't know if we will get to that point where it's good enough that we think you would have a great experience playing just by yourself, but we're definitely open to it. And that's something we're going to push on throughout the development of the game. IGN says, obviously the timeline is off the table at the moment, but is there a sense of when people might hear about more Overwatch 2? And I'm very excited about Jeff's answer here because Jeff says, yeah, our plan is very different now. When we announced Overwatch 2, we were going to explicit with the audience. I don't know if everyone remembered this, but we literally said we're going dark and we said that we're going to talk about this at the next BlizzCon. I think part of what happened was the pandemic situation. In fact, there wasn't a BlizzCon in November 2020 and things got kind of pushed off till February, but we were very explicit like, hey, we're not going to talk about this. Hey, we're not talking after this BlizzCon we just need to focus on the game. Our strategy for after BlizzCon in February 
February is to be more communicative. I don't know if I can officially commit to monthly updates on Overwatch 2, but we definitely want to be more communicative, and our plan is to not go dark for an extended period of time. In fact, we were discussing as recently as yesterday the opportunity of there being more cool stuff we could talk about in March or April to keep the community updated and keep people going. So so it's very front and center in our mind to communicate more. We also want to be careful. I think there is a right time to get the audience hyped and build to launch. And there's also a time where it's like, hey, that was not kind of not cool of you because it was too early and we're not ready to have this yet. So I think we want to be very transparent with people. I'm really glad that the discussion happened of, hey, don't expect Overwatch 2 or Diablo 4 this year because I think that helps set people's expectations. So if we do say something in March or April, they're not like, oh my God, that means we're beta in May and then release in June. It's like, no in it's out there and that's not happening so let's get our expectations aligned but we definitely want more communicative and more transparent with the development of overwatch 2 as we get into closing out of the game now yeah that's a little disappointing kind of confirms that overwatch 2 really isn't coming out this year but it's good that blizzcon or blizzcon allows jeff and the devs to now be able to talk about overwatch more now that they're not holding everything for blizzcon i'm super excited for this and he said he can't commit um to monthly updates yet but hopefully we see that a little bit in the future because i would love to see something like that what do you guys think of this whole interview i personally enjoyed it a lot and i think it's going to be super good um talking about like all this stuff and maybe monthly updates like jeff said let me know in the comments below what you guys think if you guys enjoyed the video please drop a like it helps the channel out a lot and if you want more gaming content and news hit that subscribe button and that bell so you can see all my videos when they first come out also if you want a shout out at the end of the video leave a comment and you can get picked for that thank you all very much for watching and i'll see you guys in the next one